Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Now, all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. This is it. This is the bottom line of everything. Watch. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. You know, the most intense part of any trial comes when the jury returns, the foreman hands the envelope to the judge, and the verdict is read. In those moments before the verdict is read, you can hear a pin drop in the courthouse. Not a sound. Everyone is waiting to hear the outcome of the judgment. And once the verdict is read, half of the courthouse is going to rejoice because justice has been served, and the other half will sit in disbelief, believing that an innocent man is going free. And the only person in the courthouse who really knows the truth is the one who is on trial. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but what would it be like to face a written transcript of everything you've ever done, of every word you've ever spoken, of every thought that's ever entered your head? What would it be like? You say, well, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Bad news, you do. Maybe I should say, good news, you do. You say, why is that good news, Pastor? Hold on as we look at the great judgment day. The bottom line, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. God will bring every deed into judgment, every little thing, whether it is good or evil, every hidden thing. God knows every word, every thought that you've ever thought. God knows. He brings it into judgment. And that's good news. That's good news. So Christians are going to be judged? Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's all of us. In fact, in a remarkable verse, James, the second chapter, James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now he's speaking of the Ten Commandments, the law that says you shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery. He's speaking of the Ten Commandments. If you break one, then you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. And then he makes this remarkable statement in verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law. So James, follow me, James writing to the church is looking ahead into the future and he says, I want you to speak and act as those who are going to be judged. At some time in the future, you're going to be judged. And the standard of that judgment is the law of God. Now that's a remarkable verse. It's not as though God is standing up there in heaven with those Ten Commandments waiting to judge you and if you just get one thing wrong, smash! He smashes you between the tables of stone and rubs you out. That isn't what it's about. God created us to live a certain way that will bring peace and joy and happiness to ourselves and others. Who trusts Him enough to live their lives according to the way He made us because those are the only ones He would dare to bring in to the new heaven and the new earth. He's not going to let sin rise up again. That's the purpose of the judgment. So James is looking forward. Don't miss this. James is looking forward to the time when the church will be judged by the law. But in Revelation chapter 14, 
in Revelation, the 14th chapter. Look, Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. There it is. Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Now follow me closely. James was looking forward to the time when the church would be judged and the standard of that judgment would be the law of God. He was looking ahead into the future. And now John sees the time when the gospel is being preached to the whole world. But he says the hour of God's judgment has come. It's already come. It's already begun. So something had to have happened between the time when James wrote his letter to the church and the point in the future that John saw would come just before the end of the world, before Jesus comes, when the hour of God's judgment has already come. Somewhere in between, God's judgment must have begun. And I'm going to show you that that judgment is going on right now. In order for anyone to say, fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, He would have to know when the judgment begins. And God has made that crystal clear for us. I want you to go back in your Bibles to Daniel. Daniel, the seventh chapter. We're going to cover a lot of Bible. This is a huge theme. We're going to go deep, so no room for sleeping, not even five minutes. We're going to go deep into the Scripture in Daniel chapter 7. This is review. Daniel saw a vision. And remember, he saw four beasts coming up out of the sea. The first one a lion, the second one a bear, third one a leopard, the fourth one terrifying and frightening. He had ten horns. Among the ten came a little horn. The little horn uprooted three. Now, we've already identified this. We've already learned that the first one, the lion, was Babylon, 605 B.C., and then the bear, Medo-Persia, 538, overthrew Babylon, and then in 331, the leopard overthrew the Medes and the Persians. That's the kingdom of Greece. And then we saw already that Rome in 169, the Roman Empire, overthrew the Greek Empire. That's the fourth beast, terrifying and frightening. By the year 476, Rome was divided into the ten horns on that beast. And then by 538, that little horn appeared. And he was given power to persecute the saints of God for time, times, and half a time, 1,260 years until 1798. I want you to see what's happening. We start at 605, and we're building a historical platform so that we can know that our interpretation is based solidly in the Word of God and solidly been unfolding as we look back in history exactly the way the Bible said it was. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome was divided just the way the Bible said it would be. The little horn did appear. He did uproot the three. He did try to change God's set times and laws. He did the things the Bible said he would do. And he endured for 1260 years till the deadly wound came in 1798. There's where we are in the flow of time. It's not that long ago. Now watch what happens next. As I looked, while this little horn is doing his thing, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's God the Father. And verse 10, the last half of the verse, the court was seated and the books were opened. The next thing after the little horn, Daniel describes the father, the ancient of days, takes his seat. He sits on the throne. The court is seated and the books are opened. That's the judgment day. Something else happens. Verse 13, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Who's that? That's Jesus. He's coming in the clouds. We learned last night that when Jesus comes for us, he's going to come in the clouds of glory. Now we see him coming in the clouds, but don't get caught here. Be careful. He's coming with the clouds 
of heaven and he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. So this isn't describing the second coming of Jesus when he comes for us. This describes the time when Jesus comes into the presence of the Father, the ancient of days, who was sitting on the throne during the great judgment day. What's Jesus doing there? Well, that's what we're coming to look for. And then comes the interpretation of the dreams. And the angel says the four beasts, the four kingdoms. We already know that in verse 17. In verse 20, Daniel said, Oh, I want to know about the ten horns and that other horn, the little one that came up. And then he sees that little horn persecuting God's people. Verse 21, as I watched, the little horn was waging war against the saints of God and defeating them. So you see where we are in the flow. We're looking forward to the time up, up until 1798, the deadly wound was inflicted, the little horn making war against God's people and defeating them until, verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints. That's good news. Should get a few more amens than that. He pronounces judgment in favor of the saints. So it is the court seated in judgment that finally condemns and dooms the little horn and pronounces judgment in favor of the saints and against the little horn. Don't miss this. He pronounces judgment in favor of the saints. That means that the saints and the little horn must have both been being judged. You don't pronounce judgment in favor of someone that's not being judged. Today there are a lot of cases all over the country. Jury trials and verdicts announced and not one of those judges said Jack Cologne not guilty <laughs> why not because I wasn't on trial the only time a judgment is pronounced in favor of someone is if that person is being judged if that person is on trial well the fact that that God pronounces judgment in favor of the Saints means that the Saints are being judged but praise God, the verdict is good, not guilty. That's the good news about the judgment. That's why I said the judgment is good news for us. Why is it good news? Because Jesus Christ is standing right there in front of the Ancient of Days. He is your attorney and he's never lost the case. We don't have to be afraid of the judgment, but the little horn does. The Ancient of Days came, pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. What happened to the little horn? Verse 26, the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Now, like I said before, when you cut the head off a snake, his tail flops around because the tail doesn't know he's dead yet. And our sinful nature is put to death, but every once in a while he keeps trying to stick his head up and we got to keep putting it. That's why Paul said, I die daily. But the time is coming in the judgment when the little horn will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. No more tail flopping around. Amen. He is done. He is finished forever. And then sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High, and His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey Him. Amen. That's the good news about the judgment. Saints are being tried. The little horns being tried. Why? Because they both claim to be the people of God. And it's the judgment that finally reveals the little horn for what he is and the saints for what they are. And it's the law that's the standard of the judgment. You remember the old, oh, some of you can remember, the old television game show 
to tell the truth. You remember that? Well, for those of you who don't remember, there was a panel of celebrities, and then there were three people, all claiming to be John Smith. And the celebrities would ask John Smith all kinds of different questions, and once they finished asking their questions, they had to guess who the real John Smith was. And so they would go through, they would ask their questions and do all this checking and investigating and who's who. And finally, at the end, the high point came when the, the narrator said, Now will the real John Smith stand up? And John Smith stands up. And everybody knows who the real John Smith is. You see, in the end time, we have the saints of God, and they're wanting to be obedient to God because they trust Him. They want to live their lives the way He made us. But then there's the little horn. They don't trust God. They put traditions of man in place of God, and they start beating up on the saints, claiming to be the saints of God and wanting to get them out of the way. And the judgment is, now will the real saints of God stand up? And it's the law that reveals the true saints of God. That's the purpose of the judgment. Now notice that the judgment comes sometime after this little horn, 538 to 1798. Now that's getting pretty close to our time, isn't it? But it still doesn't tell us when the judgment is. When does the judgment take place? In order for anyone to be able to preach the message of the three angels in Revelation 14, they have to be able to say not only the everlasting gospel, not only that, but they also have to be able to say the hour of God's judgment has come. How can they know exactly when it began? Because the only way they can say the hour of His judgment has come. But we're close. We're getting close but the Bible makes it even closer. And that's why God gave us the eighth chapter of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8, this time he sees a ram in verse 3 and a goat in verse 5. And the goat comes charging towards that ram and he tramples that ram down into the dirt. But then the goat has a big horn. The first king, Alexander the Great, remember, snapped off at the peak of his power. Four little horns went up in his place and the goat himself out of, the, out of the, the four winds of heaven, the Bible says. The four horns went out to the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them, out of one of the four winds, comes the fourth beast, that Roman beast. And then the little horn. And he's talking about the little horn. In verse 9, he says, Out of one of them came another horn. It started small, but it grew in power. And it grew until it reached the host of heaven. Verse 11, he set himself up to be as great as the prince of the host. He put himself in Jesus' place. We've already talked about this, haven't we? And he took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. And because of the rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. He prospered in all that he did, and truth was thrown down to the ground. That's the little horn. The little horn was condemned in the judgment because he did three things. The Bible tells us in chapter 7, verse 25, he blasphemed God. He tried to change the set times and the laws, and he persecuted the saints of God. He was condemned. Now in chapter 8, we see the same thing. He puts himself up equal to the prince of oaths. That's blaspheming God. He took away the daily sacrifice. What does that mean? And the place of his sanctuary was brought low and truth was trampled down to the ground. He tried to change God's set times and laws. Therefore, truth is trampled down to the ground. But how does he bring the place of God's sanctuary down? That's an interesting question. And hang on to that one. File it away because we're going to be coming back. Now watch. The little horn is doing his dirty work. Truth cast down, trampling on the saints of God, persecuting them. And the question is asked in verse 13, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? 
the vision concerning the sacrifice, the rebellion, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the host that will be trampled underfoot. Think about it. That question is almost asking, how long will it take until the end of the world? How long are you going to let this guy trample God's people? And here's the answer. Verse 14, after 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated or restored. Or as the King James says, it will be cleansed. Now we have a time element. But before we get to the time element, 2,300 days, there are some other things we need to see. In Daniel 7, there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome divided the little horn, ascended to, to put himself equal, tried to put himself equal to God. He was persecuting the saints. And it was the judgment that brought the little horn to his end in Daniel 7. Keep that in mind because in Daniel 8, we discover Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the little horn again. And this time, the little horn persecuting the saints of God, but it is the restoring of the sanctuary that brings the little horn to his end. Are you following me? In Daniel 7, what brings the little horn to his end? The judgment. In Daniel 8, what brings the little horn to his end? The restoring of the sanctuary. So that tells us that the judgment and the restoring of the sanctuary are two different ways of looking at the same event. The judgment clarifies for us what it is that brings the little horn to the end. The judgment according to the law. That's what brings him to his end. But it's the restoring of the sanctuary after 2300 days that tells us more about the timing of that event. And that's what we want to look at. After 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary would be reconsecrated or restored. And the restoring of the sanctuary, reconsecrating or cleansing of the sanctuary is the same event as the judgment. So we're going to take a look at the relationship between the sanctuary and the judgment. But first of all, watch what Daniel did. He was puzzled. He said he didn't understand this vision. So the angel came to explain it to him. And in verse 17 says that he was terrified. He fell to the ground. But the angel said, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Now, we know that the time of the end, the last days, began when Jesus came. We are living in the time of the end. We are living and have been living in the last days. That's why the, the book of Hebrews begins with the words, In these last days God has spoken to us through His Son. So the last days, the time of the end, is New Testament time. So that vision concerns the New Testament time. Verse 19, I'm going to tell you what will happen later, he said, at the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. So, so the angel was saying, Daniel, listen, don't be so concerned. This vision concerns a special appointed time of the end that God, only God, has in mind and knows. And then he tells us again in verse 26, Seal up the vision, it concerns the distant future. It doesn't apply to you right now, this restoring of the sanctuary, because Daniel was looking from Babylon to Jerusalem, and he knew the sanctuary is in ruins, and that's what he was worried about. But the angel says, look, Daniel, seal it up. It doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to your people. It's the distant future. It doesn't even apply to that sanctuary that's in ruins right now. But what does it apply to? It applies to the New Testament sanctuary, to the New Testament Mount Zion, to the New Testament sanctuary that is in heaven. And you may say, well, I never heard about a sanctuary in heaven. That's why we need to take a minute to go back to Hebrews, the New Testament now, in Hebrews, the eighth chapter. In Hebrews chapter 8, because remember, it's the restoring of the sanctuary that is the same as the judgment. 
And it's only when we see the relationship of the two that we can understand the judgment, the restoring of the sanctuary, and the timing of this whole prophecy. So hold on and let's go to Hebrews, the 8th chapter, verse 1. The point of what we're saying is this. This is powerful stuff. And I know it's a little bit deep, but when you get it, you're going to go, wow. You may even say amen. <laughs> Already you're seeing. Look, verse 1. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true sanctuary, set up by the Lord and not by man. Now man built the sanctuary on earth, but we have a high priest who serves in the sanctuary in heaven built by God, not man. Watch this. Verse 5, he's speaking about the priests who offered their sacrifices in that sanctuary on earth. He says, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. So there is something in heaven that the sanctuary on earth with all of its sacrifices was a copy and a shadow of. That's why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So when Moses went up on top of Mount Sinai with the two tables of stone and handed them up to God, and God wrote his law with his own fingers, handed them back down to Moses, God showed Moses something else. God showed Moses a sanctuary in heaven which was to be the pattern for the one that he built on earth. Did you hear this? Let me read it again. That's why Moses was warned, see to it you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So Moses saw a sanctuary in heaven and patterned the one on earth after what he saw in heaven. Are you with me on this? That means that there must be a sanctuary in heaven. And that's the one that Daniel was talking about in his vision when he said the vision is for the last days. It's for the end time. It's for the time of the end. It doesn't pertain to you but the appointed time. It's the sanctuary in heaven. Could not be a sanctuary on earth because the sanctuary on earth was destroyed in A.D. 70. So it must be talking about the sanctuary in heaven. But what could be in heaven that would need to be restored or cleansed? Hold on. We're coming. We're just not quite there yet. We need to understand a little more about the sanctuary. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, Verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Jesus is our high priest in the sanctuary in heaven. You do not need to go to any man to confess your sins. You go directly to Jesus. He's on the throne of grace. You confess your sins to him. You go boldly to the throne of grace confessing to Jesus Christ. No man on earth we confess directly to Jesus. So any system of worship that puts a man in the temple claiming to have the authority to forgive sins is a counterfeit to our high priest Jesus Christ in the temple in heaven. He has the authority to forgive sins. And salvation comes when we approach Jesus who is in his sanctuary ministering to us by virtue of the blood he shed on the cross for our sins. Not with the blood of goats and animals and sheep, but with his own blood. He is our high priest. And he is in heaven, in the sanctuary up there, ministering for you down here. That's good news for us. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, Now the first covenant, that's the Old Testament, had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. We already know about that. First covenant had an earthly sanctuary and regulations. He describes that sanctuary. In it, he says, was the Ark of the Covenant and the stone tablets of the covenant. The Ten Commandment law was inside the Ark of the Covenant. He says, but we don't have time to discuss these things in detail now. There's just a lot there, and maybe that would be a good subject for another Revelation Now Part 2 seminar. 
someday. The first covenant had priests, earthly priests, offering sacrifices. And every day they offered sacrifices for the sins of the people. And every day people received forgiveness for their sins. Not because of the lamb that they sacrificed, but because of the lamb of God whom that sacrifice pointed forward to. And this happened day after day. And the priest would sprinkle that blood in the sanctuary. In fact, into the actual presence of God. It's just enough to see the priest. We sprinkle that blood every day. They receive forgiveness. They go to the sanctuary. They receive forgiveness. They were forgiven for their sins. It was done then. But once a year on the Day of Atonement came the Day of Reckoning. And that was a serious time. It was a time when the priest would cleanse the holiest place in the sanctuary and they would fast and they would pray and put away every sin from their hearts, asking God to search their hearts. And those who didn't were separated from the camp. They were done. It was a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. Once a year, every day, they were forgiven. Once a year came a day of reckoning. Who was it that really trusted God? Now, an interesting thing in verse 8 of chapter 9, it said, as long as this earthly sanctuary was still standing, verse 9, it is an illustration for the present time. So the earthly sanctuary is an illustration for the present time. We cannot see Jesus, our high priest in heaven. can't see him. Well, what's he doing up there? We study the earthly sanctuary, and it illustrates for us what he's doing up there now. Oh, this is powerful stuff. It's an illustration for the present time because he went through a greater, more perfect tabernacle in verse 11. The heavenly one. Look at verse 12. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all with his own blood. So he didn't have to offer sacrifices every day. Look, verse 23, it was necessary for the copy of the heavenly things, that earthly sanctuary, to be purified with these sacrifices. That's the blood of goats and calves, the animals but the heavenly things themselves with something better. I want you to notice something I think is often overlooked by most people. Verse 23 says, It was necessary for the copy of the heavenly things, that's the earthly sanctuary, to be purified with these sacrifices, the animal sacrifices. They, the earthly sanctuary to be purified with the animal sacrifices. Are you with me? Okay, watch. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So there must be something in the heavenly sanctuary that has to be purified because it has to be purified by the blood of Jesus. And this is what has puzzled scholars ever since it was written. What could possibly be in heaven that needs to be purified? And now we're beginning to see the intimate relationship between the judgment and the restoring or purifying of the sanctuary. I want you to follow me. He entered heaven itself, Jesus, now to appear for us. One question, how does the little horn trample God's sanctuary and take away the daily sacrifice? How did the church do that? In the Mass, now you understand, the Mass is not just a worship service. It's more than that. In the Mass, the church believes that when the priest prays a special prayer, he actually changes the bread into the real body of Christ. And the priest actually changes the wine into the real blood of Christ so that in the Mass, the priest is actually offering Christ as an offering, as a sacrifice, over and over again. Now, let me read this to you. 
the power of the priest, and this is from The Faith of Millions by Reverend John O'Brien, a book written to try to persuade Protestants to become a part of the Catholic faith. He says, the power of the priest is not surpassed by any one because it is equal to that of Jesus Christ. Because in this role, the mass, the priest speaks with the voice and the authority of God himself. He reaches up into heaven and brings Christ down from his throne and places him upon our altar to be offered again for sins of man not once but a thousand times. The priest speaks and lo Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. No wonder the name which spiritual writers are especially fond of applying to the priest is that of Latin, Alta Christus. Because the priest is and should be another Christ. So you see, the Mass is the re sacrificing of Jesus over and over and over again. In fact, one said that the priest even becomes the creator of his creator when he changes the bread and the wine into the blood and the body of Christ and sacrifices him again. No wonder he thinks he has the authority to change God's set times. The Sabbath as a reminder that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, But now he has appeared once at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. One time is enough. Amen? Amen? But how, that's how he takes away the effectiveness of the daily. It's not enough by faith to pray for God to forgive you. You have to sacrifice him again over and over at the Mass. But how does he trample God's sanctuary in heaven? Watch. Verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 10. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for sins left, only a fearful expectation of judgment. So if we deliberately reject God's truth and God's commands, there is no sacrifice. No sacrifice for willful, presumptuous sin. Now, he's not talking about weakness. He's not talking about striving to do your best and falling short and asking God to forgive you and help you to do better. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about willful, presumptuous, God, I know what you want, but I think I know better. This is what I'm going to do. I'll show you how it works in a minute. So watch, no sacrifice for sin, willful, presumptuous sin. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? The Lord will judge his people. So willful, presumptuous sin is trampling Jesus Christ underfoot. And he is our high priest ministering the sacrifice that he gave for us once for all from the sanctuary in heaven. Willful, presumptuous sin is to trample the sanctuary underfoot because that's where Jesus is. Are you following me? Now watch. What does all of this have to do with the judgment? In verse 23, it was necessary, on chapter 9, Hebrews 9, verse 23, again, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things, the earthly, to be purified with these sacrifices, animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Jesus entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. So Jesus, remember, on the clouds of glory, appeared in the presence of the Ancient of Days as the court sat and the books were open for judgment. Jesus is your attorney in the judgment. He was going there to stand for you. That's why you have nothing to fear about the judgment. 
It's the judgment that cleanses and purifies God's sanctuary in heaven. If you don't see it yet, watch this. This is the best part. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to have to go fast because it's kind of review. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched. That was the mountain Moses went up on. No, you haven't come to that kind of a mountain that can be touched. Watch this, verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. So you've come to the heavenly Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the new Jerusalem. You have come to thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to the judge of all men, to Jesus, the mediator. So you don't have to be afraid because you haven't come to an earthly sanctuary. You've come to the sanctuary in heaven. You have come to Jesus. You have come to the judge. You have come to the mediator of the new covenant. Amen. So we are on Mount Zion right now. We're in the heavenly sanctuary right now. Not in the flesh, but our names are written there. Amen. Our names are written in the book. And so in verse 25 he goes on to say see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks if they did not escape when they refused him long ago who warned them on earth how much more will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven once more he said I will shake not only the earth but the heavens the words once more indicating the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. The judgment is the purifying of God's church. The removing of things that cannot be shaken. Their names are written in the books, but the judgment shows that the little horn also claims to be written in the books. And they're persecuting God's people in the name of carrying out the righteous judgments of God. Revelation 3, 5, to the church, Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will never blot his name out of the books of life. But whose name does he blot out? The little horn. Because they're persecuting God's people in, in the righteous name of God, claiming to carry out the righteous judgments of God. It's the judgment by the law that shows who the true saints of God really are. Did you keep my law? God says, oh yes, I kept your law perfectly. I never made mistakes, and when I did, I went to confession and preached, and I got forgiveness. Did you confess to me? Oh, I didn't need to do that. I could go to the priest. Oh, all my laws? Yes, what about the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, I did that one. You did. Yes, yes, Lord, I did. You kept the seventh day holy? Well, you know, we did it on the first day. But the law says, I blessed the seventh day, and I made it holy. I know, but our church told us it wasn't important. He said it didn't matter. Well, didn't I send you to Revelation now? <laughs> so when is the sanctuary going to be restored? When we answer that question, we'll know when the judgment began. Back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. He said, after 2,300 evenings and mornings or days, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Now, we know what the reconsecration or restoring or purifying means. And we're going to look at it a lot more in the advanced seminar, so you're not going to want to miss that lesson. But in order to understand the timing, it takes place at the end of 2,300 days. But that doesn't help us because he didn't say when the 2,300 days begin. And Daniel really was puzzled over that and it really bothered him. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and finally the angel Gabriel came to interpret it for him. And he said in chapter 9, verse 23, Therefore consider the message and understand the vision. That's the one he was worrying about. In verse 24, 
70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. You have 70 weeks to do all these things. Now you tell me, 70 weeks to bring in everlasting righteousness, atone for wickedness, seal up the vision, anoint the most... Who alone can do these things? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. So you have 70 weeks to get ready for Jesus. You see it? He's saying you have 70 weeks to get ready for the Messiah. Now we have 70 weeks until getting ready for the Messiah to come and 2,300 days and then the judgment begins. But we still don't know when either one of these time periods start until we get to the next verse. Now comes the fun. In verse 25, no one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was in ruin. So when the decree is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's 69 weeks. From the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem until the anointed one, that's the Messiah, Jesus, until he comes 69 weeks. Now that decree was given in the year 457 B.C. One of my professors in the seminary, Old Testament professor, was world renowned, was, he's passed away, but he was world renowned as an archaeologist and he focused a whole book on that date. When did that decree, when was that decree given? And he discovered it was given by King Artaxerxes in the year 457 B.C. And he said there is no... Old Testament date any more firmly established than that one. No wonder. Because at the end of that 69 weeks, starting in 457 B.C., at the end of that 69 weeks would be the Messiah coming. We have a prophecy beginning in 457 B.C. and after 69 weeks the Messiah would come. There are seven days in a week. 7 times 69 means that there would be 483 days or a day being a symbol for a year, 483 years until Messiah comes from the decree. When you do the math, it comes out to the year 27 A.D. 27 A.D. What happened in 27 A.D.? Jesus, let me tell. <laughs> Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River in the year 27 A.D. Now, the word Messiah means anointed one. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down and anointed him, saying, God said, you are my son, I am well pleased. He was anointed as the Son of God by the Holy Spirit in 27 A.D. to be the Messiah. Amen. That's awesome. Right on time, Jesus came as the Messiah. No wonder he said in Mark 1.15, he said, the time is fulfilled right after his baptism. What time? The prophecy of 69 weeks until Messiah comes would be fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled that prophecy right on time when he was baptized in 27 A.D. Then it says, after that time, verse 26, the anointed one or the Messiah would be cut off and have nothing. But the people of the prince who would come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. So he would be cut off after that time. We know he was. After he was baptized, he was cut off, wasn't he? But it doesn't say when yet. Well, it's this. Verse 27. We have one week left, remember? 69 weeks Messiah would come, 70 weeks to prepare for everything, put an end to sin, atone for sacrifice. We still have another week left, the 70th week. That's seven years. Watch this. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's seven years. And in the middle of the week, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. So 27 A.D., he had seven more years to go. The middle of the week would be three and a half years later. That's 31 A.D. What happened in 31 A.D.? Gee, let me tell... Jesus died on the cross. And when he died, 
the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom by the unseen hands of, now you can talk. Angels tore the veil, meaning that Jesus put an end to the sacrifices and the offerings because the Lamb of God had died. Right on time in the year 31 A.D. He came in 27. He was crucified in 31 A.D. What a prophecy. It tells us exactly when he would come. And he did. It tells us exactly when he would die. And he does. Now we know the starting point of that vision. It starts in 457. The starting point is true. A year is a symbol for a day is true. We proved it with the prophecy. Now we can know. 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored. A year is a symbol for a day. 2,300 years the sanctuary would be restored the judgment would begin and it equals 1844 now that's getting closer to our time what happened in 1844 the judgment began how do we know that because Jesus came right on time because a day is a symbol for a year because Jesus died on time because our starting point is absolutely correct Therefore, the judgment had to begin in 1844. And anyone after that can say, now the hour of God's judgment has come. We can know. God made sure we can know. But some other things happened about that time. All around the world, equally independent of each other, Bible scholars came to the conclusion that this prophecy ended in 1844. Now, they thought that the restoring of the sanctuary would be that the sanctuary is the earth and the restoring of the sanctuary would be Jesus coming to the earth. So they started preaching, Jesus is coming in 1844. And this happened all over the world, but especially in our country, the United States of America, it was led by a young Baptist minister named William Miller. And William Miller began to preach Jesus coming in all the Baptist churches. And then the other churches, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the other churches started inviting him to come and preach in their churches that Jesus is coming in 1844. Now, if you believed that you knew when Jesus was coming and it was just a month or two away or a week or two away, would it change your life? Shouldn't. <laughs> right? It shouldn't. Hey, we have no guarantees past the moment. But... I know human nature, so does God, and it did. There was a revival like none that had ever taken place since Pentecost. People turning to God, searching their hearts for sin, trying to get ready for Jesus to come. They even set the date, October 22, 1844, that they came and passed, and obviously Jesus didn't come. When he didn't come, there was a great bitter bitter disappointment you see when they were preaching that Jesus was coming all of those who believe that were called Adventists because an Adventist is one who believes that Jesus is coming soon in that sense every Christian should be an Adventist if you believe Jesus is coming soon so they're all Adventists Methodist Presbyterian Episcopal Pentecostal whatever they were Adventists because they believed Jesus was coming but the disappointment was so bitter that most of them gave up their faith. But a few said, no, the prophecy is right. The prophecy is true. And they dug into the Word of God for more. And they found a picture of themselves. Did you ever say, God, please help me and open the Bible and there is exactly what you need to hear? Now, I don't recommend doing that, but that's what happened to them. They found the picture of the experience they'd just been through. You want to see it? I'll show you anyway. <laughs> Revelation chapter 10. Revelation, the 10th chapter. I saw in verse 1 a mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was holding a little scroll or a book which lay open in his hand. Daniel was sealed, remember? Seal it up until the time of the end. Now they see this book open. They're convinced that has to be the book of Daniel, only one that was sealed. And then he said there would be no more delay in verse 6. Does that sound like the hour of God's judgment has come? Sounds like it to me. No more delay. Verse 8, Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go and take that book that lies open in the hand of the angel. 
So I went to the angel and I asked him, give me the little scroll. And he said, take it and eat it. It'll turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it'll be sweet as honey. I took the little book from the angel's hand. I ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but I'd eaten it. It turned sour. Sweet as honey. The book of Daniel opened. Jesus is coming. 1844, October 22. How sweet it was in their mouths, but how bitter it was in the stomach when Jesus didn't come. And they were convinced without a doubt that prophecy was written there just for them. And so I said, God, that's us. What do you want us to do? And God said, well, read the next verse. Oh, okay. So they read the next verse. The last verse in the chapter, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, languages, and kings. How can we prophesy again? God, we got it wrong. And God said, read the next verse. So they read the next verse. See, you got to compare Scripture with Scripture. I was given to read like a measuring rod. Go and measure the temple of God and the worshipers there. The temple. That's where we made our mistake. The temple of God. And so they began to study the temple and they discovered the sanctuary in heaven that he was talking about, not the sanctuary on earth. Now they're excited and they didn't need God to tell them to read more because they're back into the Spirit again and they're studying and discovered in verse 18 the time has come for judging the dead. Oh, surely the temple in heaven, the judgment. It's the judgment that began in 1844. Now it's all getting in clear focus. And then verse 19, God's temple in heaven was open and in the temple was seen the ark of his covenant. What is the standard of the judgment? If the judgment began, what's the standard? There was the ark of the covenant covenant the Ten Commandments and that little group of disappointed Adventists from all the different churches discovered the Sabbath and became Seventh-day Adventists just in time for God to raise up a people who wouldn't be afraid to stand up and say, fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Amen. You see, God has crafted a message. He said, here's my message, the three angels' messages. Who wants it? No one picked it up except that little group of discouraged Adventists who discovered the last great sign for Jesus to come. The hour of God's judgment has come. Amen. You see, the book of Revelation is not for off in the distant future. The future is here. The prophecy is now. Revelation is now, you're hearing the three angels' messages. Now, there was ever a time to worship the Creator. That time is now.